Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma. Michael is the author of Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, the forgiveness doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. And the truth that is rooted within me. And good morning. Well, it's good morning here on the Pacific time. It's afternoon in the Middle and Eastern time. So we welcome you to our show. The phone number to call in is 646-200-4169. And we welcome you to either ask questions in the chat room or call in and ask your questions. Press 1 if you want to uh, speak to the host, and we'll put you in queue. Michael's not on the show yet, but he will be shortly. It's been busy ever since we got to Oregon yesterday. We went to two different meetings last night. One of them was on finding the voice of the spirit within, and uh, the other one was Michael speaking to a group in a place called the Peace House. And we had an awesome group there last night, and the momentum's already kicking in and going. And so this morning, Michael is doing a Course in Miracles class uh, here in Ashland. And we have things going on the rest of this week and all next week. We actually have 14 straight workshops. So if you're in the Ashland area or you know someone in the Ashland or Med- Medford area, please uh, send them to our website where they can pick up the flyers and and, uh, participate in it. They're all free except for one that we're doing on Saturday, June the 18th, and that's a Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing Workshop. And you can contact us to register for that. David, I see you're already on the phone with me. Good morning. Good morning, Jeannie. How are you doing? I am doing good. uh, (laughs) Yeah, can you hear me? I I can. As you have experienced... As you have experienced in the past, it's a challenge to do the switchboard, the chat room, and be the host. <laughs> so, oh, so I'm trying to talk, talk yes, and I read. Know. So many things going on. <laughs> so uh, is, let me ask you, is Michael scheduled to be on soon? He is. The uh, Course in Miracles class started at 10, and it was only supposed to go for 45 minutes, but we also know how that goes. So <laughs> he was supposed to be out of it in time to get on, but uh, as of right now, he's, he's not on there yet. So I'm sure that they um, have captured his attention or are hanging on to him there in the Course in Miracles class. Yeah, and you know, to me, Gene, that's exactly what goes on with this work. And, and as soon as we learn things, uh, as soon as we all of a sudden tap into um, this, this source, this information, this this way of letting go, of knowing that we're something other than what it is that we've we've taught ourselves and have been taught to believe, that tapping into that true source of who it is that we are, then people want to hold on to that. You know, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I've never seen it like this before. I call them the ahas, you know, that spiritual aha of waking up, of, of transcending, you know, ending that trance of of just going along and doing things the way that uh, that we've always done them, just because it's automatic, you know, just like a, with the machine. And it's uh, when we do get the opportunity in order to learn something new, really tap into that. And I love it how Michael has put that out there about the word of education, that, you know, the as he talks about the root word of that is educar, which means to draw out. And when being around someone that has the skill and the ability in order to connect with people and have them to draw out of them for them to be able to see that that that, that source is within them, that that's the key to all of it. Uh, I was watching one of his uh, early, early 
early videos uh, on doing a workshop up in uh, Michigan City that he hadn't even written the book, Why Is This Happening to Me Again? And he was doing the workshop, and he started it out. He asked, invited people to make to write out four things, four most important things in their life. And then after a few minutes, he invited them, to, and he started out with the stories, you know, that's on the worksheet, the Rose and the Butterfly. Oh, there he is. Hey. Hey. Hi, nice Mike. to meet you. Keep going, Bobby. David. Finish your story yeah. there. Well, Go ahead you. and finish your story. Well, it's Michael's story about the rose and the butterfly. That uh, suppose that there's a rose and a butterfly, and they meet, and they're given a uh, ego or and or maybe a personality, and they fall in love, and they're so connected with each other that. Uh, and then all of a sudden the butterfly decides to fly away, and it flies away, and the rose uproots itself and gives chase what happens to the rose. And the people get to see that, you know, the rose will die. And when we lose connection with our true essence of who it is that we really are, well, then we've started this death process. And it goes on and on and on until we, in that trance, wake up to the realization of who it is that we are, our true source, and what, that we're always connected. And when we're connected with that true source, that's that guidance, that's that information. And so I kind of get it, you know, it's like being in, in one of the workshops that that information starts to flow through, and it's kind of like, uh, well, I, I'll use the analogy of like um, in the Matrix when all of a sudden Neil woke up and if you remember, you know, the, the green things when he was looking at all of the three agents out there, and he just saw them for what it really is, the energy of what it really was, and he was like, whoa. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what he was doing. It's like, whoa, it's amazing. So when people get to be involved in the workshops and the information and tap into through Michael, the, that energy and that source, it's like, oh, stick around, stay on, you know. And as it is with this radio show, that we're tapping into connectedly, energetically, and through this this wave of energy of, of computers and cell phones. I mean, you know, here I am in uh, the heartland and. Missouri and you're in Oregon and there are people in England and there are people all over the world that we're tapping into the source, this truth, the, the, the source that we refer to as the truth. And as Michael says, we don't really, you know, we, we can't experience the truth through words. We can only experience the truth through tapping into our true essence, our source, when we're connected with that source. And so that's what this Mind Shifters is all about, and I'm so grateful to, to be part of Michael and Jeannie and everyone that's connected with us, actually with everyone that we're connected and doing this. And then as we all do this little worksheet, you know, I get it, Michael, that we're, we're, we're closer now than ever before, and it's starting to accelerate with uh, more people get, tapping into Wow, you mean I'm in charge? I'm the one that's in charge of this, and I can create from this my life, my world, and how it is that I see it. So uh, I, I talked with Michael earlier this morning and asked him if he might, uh, if it seemed appropriate to talk about the judgment system of how it is uh, uh, of the mind and how it works, and when we what, what 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 that part that gets triggered when fear and hostility come up, anything other than love, and how the judgment system, the part, the, system, the part that it plays in that. So that's what I'm at, but bef okay? Before he does that, okay. David, Lisa is in the chat room, and everybody else in the chat room says, Happy Eternal Day to you. Uh, thank you very much. Much, much appreciated. I uh, I have shared this with a couple of uh, people this morning, and so I appreciate that. Uh, and this is the 
best one of my so far of my eternal life. It's really fabulous that uh, I get to connect with people on this day. So thank you very much. You are welcome. So, Michael, do you want to address so that we, first, and then we so also... Jeannie? Huh? So my, uh-huh. my, my, I have a request. It just popped. It just came to me again because I made this this morning. Is that so? If people would like to, uh, like, wish me a happy birthday. So I'm beginning a new um, uh, way of of uh, communicating, and I invite and ask people if they so feel inclined to tell me one thing of what it is that they like about me. And when they see that in me, how they feel. And then to also to invite them to take a look at what is the one thing that they dislike about me and how they feel and when it comes up for them. Because for me, that's, uh, that's true connectiveness. Michael was talking about that this morning. Actually, was you know in the video with that that the people that we're really connected with are the that bring our stuff up. And so, if there's someone out there that wants to email me or say something to me or talk about this, well, then I'm open for talking about that. So well, that's I'd like to say Thank that you. what I appreciate about you and like about you is how you just are right there. You are such support. For anybody and everybody that's willing, I mean, even support for bringing their stuff up. (laughs) You're willing to just be right there. Someone in the chat room says, I like your dedication. So, and uh, what I dislike about you is there's not two of you. (laughs) Okay, so that's a little bit more of that. I'll have to think about that one. I'll have to think about that one, David. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope we can handle two of them. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, when you know, I, I picked that up. I'm not certain from where oh, I could I could think about it. You know, a lot of people ask me. So, oh, I know where it was at. It, it was from the uh, letter that you put out there, Michael, uh, about the uh, fellow that that uh, had the accident and was going through all of this stuff and everything, and uh, about choosing the day. And they, he would he would be asked. He says, "So, how are you doing?" Uh, and he said, "If it was any better, I'd be a twin." Uh, and that's I, I've taken that on, and I've used that so many times because I went through knowledge, and you know, of who it is that I am. And at the same time, so it's like when Jeannie was talking about, she appreciates that I'm there and I'm with the support. And so I invite people to take a look and say, so what kind of feeling did you have, Jeannie? Because the fact that. We can't see it in someone else unless we see it in ourselves. It has to be within us. And so I invite people to say that to me and then to tell them to to say it out loud to me how they're feeling because I have a motive. I want them to be able to recognize, you know, that, that that's not me. That's really you that you're talking to. And I like to have that, invita- that invite people to do that. That's my purpose. And it depends on it depends on uh, the support that you're giving me. How I feel if you're supporting me and facing my stuff at that moment, I don't feel very good. But afterwards, I'm really glad that you hung in there. We've been partners before during intensives, and and so um, being the support to hold me accountable, but also being the support to hold the space of love for me. And so it makes me feel very good and very supported and very um, positive. And then, like I said, when my stuff is up and you're and you're being a different support for me, sometimes it it brings up my irritation, but that gives me an opportunity. And I just appreciate you and happy eternal day. Thank you very much, Jeannie. Much appreciated. And yes, we have been partners, and I love that. Yeah. And so, Michael, we do have a leftover question from yesterday, and that person is in the chat room, so I don't know if you want to address that first or if you want to do David's thing on the on the judging. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just – I actually didn't hear the whole thing on judging, so let's let that go at the moment. But um, but let's uh, – let, let me throw out, David, one of the things I appreciate about you is your willingness 
to do your work and when you're in your stuff and you're confronted that you're there to own it and and then you pick up and you actually follow through with using the tools and it's awesome I haven't seen too many people who are really truly willing to do that uh, and so I, I really acknowledge you and appreciate you for that and that you follow through and that you are continuously doing your work and uh, you're, you're one of the fastest I've ever seen and the most willing at, willing to be responsible and then to take it into the world of actuality, to, to bring it through to the world and support people in, in the healing process. So I appreciate your presence in our world that I get to share the planet with you. I uh, deeply appreciate the fact that you are part of our support team at Heartland, holding the space there, carrying forward so many projects and, uh, and handling so many phases of so many things. Well, that gives us the support to be out here on the road, being able to take it to uh, to the people we're taking it to. So I, I deeply acknowledge you and deeply appreciate you, and uh, thanks for being in our world. Uh, you're most welcome. My pleasure and my honor. I thank you very much. All right, sir. Blessing. So you've got a question from yesterday, Jeannie, that we had promised somebody, and the person who had asked the question is with us? Cool. Awesome. Yeah, and so what we had been talking about is they had mentioned that they felt pain when they saw someone else in pain. And so we were going to discuss that, that, you know, um, you can't feel someone else's. And one of the things that I had told them in in the private chat yesterday was that once you've worked through something that you just stand as a space, that the same situation is going on and you may be in, you know, they may be in pain, but... It's different for you. So can you address that a little more, That, sure. that if you feel it well, is yours? Yeah, one of the games that the non-being mind plays is the non-being mind plays the game of sympathy. Oh, I see that you are in such pain, and I feel your pain. And someone goes into suffering with that person. And I'd offer that when you go into suffering, you're going into suffering around that person, not because of their pain, but because their pain resonates your pain. And you're no servant, you're no support for them when you're in your pain and trauma about what appears to be their pain and trauma. So people who go into sympathy, there's a a great line in The Course in Miracles that says, what you see in another you reinforce both in them and in yourself. And the idea is to see through the suffering, see through the pain which is impossible to do if you haven't healed your own, and to be able to stay connected to your original being, love, in the presence of their pain. When you stay connected to the presence of your love, your being, in the presence of their pain, then you become an uplifting force in their lives. If their pain resonates your pain, and you blame them, that is you say, I feel your pain, you're not really supporting them at all. You're holding them in that trauma or that pain. So in in the last analysis, what I can't hold the space of love for is my work. What I can't hold, and, you know, we establish the definition of human life by holding a newborn child. And when you hold a newborn and you tap into the essence of that newborn, you know what human life is, you know what your life is. It is the active presence of love. That active presence of love transforms all pain. If you can't reach to that active presence of love when your pain comes up, then you need some support. You need to do some forgiveness work if you want to shift and change that. And so when your pain comes up, if you can stay connected to love, then you will process yourself. You'll start to move yourself through that pain. And if you can't, then you invite and ask for support. And if you've got a team that uh, really knows how to support you, then you'll have someone who can hold the space while you go through that. Then you're a fit servant to support another who's in trauma. Does that address the question? I I don't see it in the chat room, seeing as how I'm driving down the road. Right. I think that does, and there's another part in the same conversation talked about, uh, you know, that when we create things in our life, whether it's situations that bring up, you know, fear or anger for our healing or whatever, um, 
I'm, I'm not exactly sure, and if, if this person would like to call in, that would be awesome because I may not be translating what we talked about yesterday exactly um, how you meant it. But there was a conversation about that we can't change something that's after it's created. So, like, if we create a situation, you know, another person comes in, that we can't change that once it's created. And I was trying to explain that, yes, you change, you can delete, the forgiveness is deleting the feelings that it brings up for you. Uh, you can't change the actuality, but you can change your reality about it. Yeah, if I if I hold the reality that somebody did something that caused me all this pain, then I reinforce the presence of my pain and I get stuck there. When I choose to forgive, I delete the source of my pain, and then I'll just see someone doing a behavior. It won't be a, they did it to me. It'll just be a behavior, whatever it is. If the behavior is based in what we would probably all call insanity, you know, they did something really crazy, then instead of me being in trauma and drama around their behavior, I'll stand as a space of love, and I'll say, gee, it looks like you got something going on. Can I support you? Can I hold the space for you? Can I assist you in forgiving whatever is at the root of this bizarre off-the-wall behavior? And so, you know, that, that statement from the ancient Aramaic of why are you trying to take the speck out of your brother's eye? Well, you have a log in your own. So if I have pain or turmoil around your behavior, I have a log in my eye. Now, you may have a log in your eye, too, or a speck, but your log and your speck isn't my business. The first order of business is I need to clean the log out of my own. So once I do that and arrive back at a space of connectedness and love, then I am the space in which you can heal, and I won't any longer be concerned about being your victim. I'll simply see you as one who's crying, calling for love, and, hey, I'm willing to be the space because I have nothing left in me around whatever it is you're doing. And, of course, that's a, you know, if you go back to Yeshua when he says the first law is that you have love. You keep the condition of love in your mind when you think of God, when you think of neighbor, when you think of self. It calls us out of all of the insanity, all of the rage, all of the fear, all of the hatred, all of the vengeance of the world to move us back into the true active presence of love, which is what we're designed to function out of. And so we become each other's support team rather than each other's accuser when we're willing to be responsible and hold to a human life whatever happens. If I have, a, a, you know, let's take the most terrible event that could happen, I can experience the most terrible event that could happen in my life from a space of connectedness and love, or I can experience it from a place of drama and trauma. That's my choice. Now, if we've come up in a family system and a culture that says, oh, no, if there's drama and trauma out there, you've got to be in drama and trauma, then it'll be virtually impossible for me to conceive of I could actually experience from the being I am, love, what just happened and not be lost in drama and trauma. And ultimately, that's the calling, like, to call us out of the world. You know, they, in the old language, it was come out of Egypt. Egypt is the world of separation. It is the world of hostility, rage, grief, fear, anger, jealousy, hatred, vengeance, war. And to come out of that is to become responsible within yourself for any of those frequencies, apply forgiveness and remove them, and come to experience everything in your life from a connected space of love. That's what we're here to do. And that's what we're here to support you in doing. Every mind, heart, and okay. being. And, of okay, course, so we thought, this is day, let, let's just throw this thought in. This is day uh, 12. 12, I think. Day 12 of our celebration of Memorial Day. And that is the... Uh, willingness to remove oops, the willingness to celebrate Memorial Day one more time today. We're going to carry this on on a daily basis 
to celebrate Memorial Day by being willing today to look at one thing in my life that is made of hostility and fear and to be willing to forgive that one thing in my life that's made of hostility and fear. And when I'm willing to do that and forgive, then I become one who helps to remove from planet Earth war because all war is made of hostility and fear. Sadly, most people today, it seems, uh, at least I've had several people share with me how their celebration of Memorial Day was, you know, we went out and got a case of beer and burgers and we got drunk. And we it was a day off work. <laughs> our, our request is that you actually honor those who have been forced to kill or to kill or to be injured, wounded, maimed, emotionally traumatized by war. And that to really, truly honor them, we each day are willing to look at one thing in ourselves that we're ready to let go of that's based in hostility or fear that we're ready to forgive. So I invite everybody to join us in that today, day 12 of our celebration of Memorial Day. Awesome. Okay, they wrote in the chat room, um, the only pain, and I think we're probably really close to saying the same thing, just using a little bit different terminology. The only pain itself is the concept of pain when it comes to something I'm searching for in my connection with it. I think they're saying the same thing as, you know, we have a goal and we're not getting it and it brings something up for us. Um, so we're searching for something, and it's our own concept, our own reality of pain. But then they go on to say, my question doesn't involve why I have pain. It's the concept of why it's being brought to my attention. Okay, well, that's a good one. And because we are energetic beings and we live in an energetic world, when I hold some form of pain in me, and, and usually the normal human being is in denial of that. Their, their pain is all about everybody else. Everybody else made me feel this way. They made me angry. They made me sad. They made me afraid. So when I'm living in a world of some form of pain, then that energy, especially the more I deny and dissociate from it, presses out from me into a measurable high-energy wave. And I will resonate or pull somebody into my space to bring that up for me, that will be guided to do a behavior. You know, I, I, I use the example oftentimes in the workshop of, you know, imagine or, or if you ever noticed yourself going into somebody's space, totally committed to being loving, nurturing, caring, and supportive, and all of a sudden found yourself functioning like a mad banshee. It's like, what happened? I went there to be loving and supportive. What happened was their psychic megaphone, the high energy wave radiating from them, matched or resonated with my mad banshee. And so up comes my mad banshee. And now I have a response that's other than the one I chose or intended. And that's my opportunity to forgive that response in me to forgive that particular form of anger or rage or fear, whatever it happens to be. So I will continuously draw or resonate somebody into my space, you know, in, a, in our natural state. If you go back once again, hold the newborn, tap into the, the awesome presence of love that the newborn is. If we had never put anything else into our fields, if our genetics contain nothing but that awesome presence of love, then I would offer the purpose of life would be aliveness, joy, and creativity. But the moment that we defile our temples, the moment we put something into our body-mind unit that does not belong in a body-mind unit, the purpose of the world changes. And at that moment, I would offer, the purpose of the world is to kick us right square in the limitation. Life abhors death. Life, ab life abhors you holding something with which you destroy yourself. So life just taps right in, the law of resonance takes over, and somebody shows up that knows exactly and precisely how to give me the look. How do they know? Because I've been telegraphing energetically, and if there's only one person in the world that can play that particular insanity out with me, you know, and maybe they're in China today, they don't know what it was that inclined them to get on an airplane to fly into LaGuardia Airport the day that I arrived there. 
They don't know what it was that just led them down the incorrect hallway so that they were right at the corner uh, where I was arriving and bump into each other and do that behavior. They may not know why they're there, but it is by divine appointment. It is by the law of resonance. And so everybody that shows up in our lives is going to show us something about ourselves. If it's the good, then we say, oh, you are so awesome, and it's done with smoke and mirrors, you're looking at yourself. If it's the bad and the ugly, then it's showing you something about yourself. And so everything in that context becomes an opportunity to learn forgiveness if what comes up is something is less than love. And, you know, we have this test that we've developed because our mind can always show us the picture that what we're experiencing is about somebody else, you know, it's all their fault that I'm feeling this, but and, and so they cause these feelings, and, and we've developed this test for determining whether or not something you're feeling is yours or not. And the test is this. Are you feeling it? If you're feeling it, though you're in denial and your mind's showing you pictures about how everybody else is causing it, if you're feeling it, you absolutely know it's yours. Time to forgive. Time to remove that. Return to your true human essence and become a healer of the world rather than one that taps in through some form of hostility or fear and supports war in the world. We're here to eradicate war from planet Earth. We can do it in our generation. And all we have to do is hit a critical mass. All we have to do is find enough people who are really truly committed to the incarnation of love in their forms which means, of course, everything less than love has to come up and be moved out. And when we can get a critical mass, and one of my early mentors used to say that all it would take would be eight people. If eight people would totally, completely incarnate and remove all hostility and fear from their feelings, we may then have the critical mass that will create such a strong space of being on the planet that the whole of humanity would shift its energy and start to realize who we are. We all started out exactly the same. I don't care if it's your worst enemy. I don't care who you look at, if it's Hitler or Saddam Hussein or, you know, Attila the Hun. We all started out the same newborn essence, and the world laid its thumbprints upon us. Forgiveness is about removing the thumbprints not letting other people off the hook because the thumbprints are there. Does that fit for the person asking the questions? Any other comments there, Jeannie? Um, there is a, a couple other comments, but we also have a hand up, so let me read one more. And uh, they, uh, Hold on. When somebody else types, it rolls me down so that I miss what I was getting ready to read to you. Just one second. Um, so anyway, they say um, your construct may be right, but from my point, I learned that we can't delete anything. We can only make things to be a different situation. And um, I wanted to give one example. We can change our reality, and we can delete our reality. And I'll give you a perfect example of it. One of the issues that I have worked on for years was that I wasn't worthy of being listened to. And, I mean, I've done lots of worksheets on it. And then... This has been a few months back. We were in Florida, and we did a, an all-day workshop. And there was we were doing intense process work with each other, like in a small intensive. And there was a gentleman there, and he had asked a question, and I put my input into it. And the class went on. Well, when we took an intermission for lunch, then someone else in the room came up to me and said, can I talk to you a minute? And I was like, yeah. And so we went to another room, and she said, did you notice when you were giving him input, he wasn't even listening to you? Now, that was the issue that I've worked on for years, and it was awesome that she brought it to my attention because I had not even, it had not even come into my awareness that he wasn't listening to me. And it was like, oh, cool, that means that I have finally deleted that issue out of, of feeling unworthy. And so then I pr proceeded to process her that, you know, perhaps you've got some issues with it because it definitely brought up some stuff for her that he wasn't listening to me. And so it was like there wasn't a point in my life where it was like, oh, okay, I'm done with that one, until it was brought to my attention and I realized I did not have the same reaction. I had no emotional attachment to whether he listened or not. It was, and it was awesome. It was wonderful. So that, for me, was a very pronounced 
okay, I finally got that one deleted. Now, the same situation, the same scenario happened, but I had a different reaction. So I didn't delete, and this person's referring to that everybody is another part of their self and that that's why you can't delete it. And, I'm, and you're not trying to delete the other person. Just like uh, that exact scenario, the same thing happened that had happened in the past, but I had no emotional attachment to it. I had deleted my unworthiness. It didn't change the scenario. It didn't delete the other person. It deleted what was in me that didn't belong and made the big difference. Yeah, that's an awesome example, and, um, you know, that's one of the things when people start to actually put the pen to the paper on the reality management worksheet, and I invite whoever's uh, in the chat room to, to go to www.whyagain.com, and on the right-hand side, there's a link that says Download Worksheets, and download the first two links under that. The first one is a, a new Chapter 24 for my book, Why Is This Happening to Me Again, on the Aramaic Idea of Forgiveness, and then the second link is the actual worksheet and start to put the pen to the paper. I certainly, and one of the first things people notice as they start to do that is that reactions, as you're describing, that were there yesterday, all of a sudden you go like, well, wait a minute, where, where is that? That that I should be coming up with hostility. I should be coming up with grief. I should be coming up with rage here. And it's gone. You'll start to notice those things are just gone. Uh, have they been deleted? Well, you could use the term they've been transmuted uh, if you wanted to, but what you'll find is that reality has been changed. It isn't there in you anymore. Now, I certainly understand that with the way the world teaches forgiveness, in other words, if I have a painful reaction in me, the world says I should forgive you. And so if I'm going around saying, well, you made me angry, but it's okay, I'll forgive you. You made me sad, but it's okay, I'll forgive you. You made me afraid, but it's okay, I'll forgive you. Of course, my anger, my sadness, and my fear aren't going to be deleted. They're not going to disappear because I'm not using forgiveness. I'm using a cheap copy of forgiveness. I'm letting you off the hook for what's happening inside of me. So if you don't have the tool of actual forgiveness, uh, it certainly makes sense that you'd come to believe that you can't delete things, because you can if you don't have forgiveness. Please go to the website, download those first two links under Download Worksheets, and it'll show you exactly how to delete and remove what never belonged. And I'd offer that there is no reason on the green earth for you to ever experience anything in your life through hostility, rage, grief, fear, or pain, except that there's hostility, fear, rage, grief, or pain in you. And there's a delete key. It's called forgiveness. When you use it, you'll remove those things. And what will happen is you'll shift from seeing yourself as being attacked when you let go of all attack in you and all defense in you, and you'll see this person crying out for, please, love me, support me. And all of a sudden, it's got nothing to do with forgiving them. It's recognizing that if I have a reality of something less than love, then I need to apply forgiveness to remove that which is less than love. And it's it... it takes us back into our original nature, which is so much bigger than all the insane dynamics of the world. And there's, a, there's another great line in The Course of Miracles that I love that says, all problems are meaningless, but don't tell that to somebody who's in the middle of one. Because if our identity is tied up in that which is based in hostility or fear, it could seem like you're taking away one's whole identity to say, by the way, that's all an illusion. It doesn't need to exist in you, and you can remove it. It's like, wait a minute, you're not taking away my identity. You know, if you go back to the ancient Aramaic, you hear the man named Yeshua saying, in order for you to live, you've got to die. Well, that doesn't make sense. What, I'm going to go kill my body in order to live? That's, that's ridiculous. But what he's saying there is, if you've built a false identity based in hostility, fear, grief, rage, and pain, as you begin to apply forgiveness, you're going to delete that self that's based in hostility or fear. That self is going to die. And, and it can be experienced as a very threatening thing when that identity starts to seep away from you. It's actually been called the dark night of the soul. You read a book by St. John of the Cross. And the dark night of the soul is the point where the identity of hostility and fear is beginning to fade away 
And the identity of being, the newborn energy of love, is coming back. If we're not grounded yet solidly in that true identity of being, then it can seem as though we're losing ourselves when the non-being self begins to die. And it can be a very dark place because we're not grounded enough yet in being and yet, and and we're terrified of, of losing the self that isn't because it's the only self we know. And it seems like non-existence. It's like standing on the edge of the abyss and there's nothing left of me now. Well, when you let go of the last thread of hostility and fear, what's left is the awesome presence of this just Undescribable. There, there are not words that can even begin to describe the awesome presence of love that you are. If you go back to Yeshua 2,000 years ago, he said to his disciples, he said, there are so many things I want to tell you, so many things I want to talk to you about, but you can't hear them. You're so steeped in that hostility and fear that you just can't hear them yet. So come on board, take the tools, let's go to work. Now, it's a pretty big job. You remember there were... 12 guys that um, worked full-time with him for three years. Think about that. Three years full-time with the ultimate master. And then, toward the end of it all, when the stress was up and the chips were down, what did they do? Well, the head dude cursed him, actually cursed him as he denied him, and got the heck out of Dodge. Ten of the 11 others ran away in fear three years and they didn't get it and of course they made up lots of doctrines and lots of dogmas based in their fear and we still have people supposedly in the name of the man named Yeshua who are living out of fear promoting fear keeping people in fear doctrines of fear doctrines of threat doctrines of condemnation doctrines of how this creature called love who Yeshua says is our father whose good pleasure it is to give us the kingdom who gives us what we ask for before we even ask that that's something to be terrified of. And, you know, it's time just to give all that up. It's time for us to give up fear-based theology and go to a love-based theology. And the only way you can do that is to give up the fear-based mind and go to a love-based mind. It's what you're designed to think with. It's designed to what you're designed to live out of. And it's an awesome game to do. And none of the rest is necessary. Now, as long as you want to do it, that's, that's cool. That's up to you. But nothing based in hostility or fear is necessary in any way, shape, or form. Awesome. And we do have a caller. Awesome. 607, you're on the air. Hey, Michael, it's Richard. Sorry, I missed six hours. Hey there, young man. I I was just finishing off. I actually uh, was doing a Course in Miracles lesson when you called me, and uh, that's why I was a couple of minutes late getting on the radio show. So as soon as we get off, I'll call you back about the uh, intensives, and we'll get that set up and arranged. But other than that, do you have a question or comment for us on our conversation? Well, I do. I actually joined a little late, uh, about a quarter after, but I happened to catch when you were talking about the, you know, being in the situation. I was actually in a situation last night describing exactly what you were talking about, where this person's behavior was ranting and raving and upset about something, and, 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 and I was had to be there in his presence, and I was feeling it. I was feeling it in my arm, this pain of me wanting to strike back and say, you know, can you stop this, you know? <laughs> and I was just holding myself back and, and you know, after he left, then I felt that pain in my arm, uh, and it was like okay. And so I, you know, definitely got out and did the worksheet and and worked on removing the pain that was in with the knee. And as you say, you know, it's he was resonating something that was in me, and it was the pain. And um, awesome, you 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 hit it all right. You you like you you're describing the situation perfectly as to what was what was there and I just want to follow that with this, another incident that happened this morning where actually I was basically uh, I, I came across the uh, neighbor's dog got loose and was out in front of our house and 
person was trying to catch it, and we were trying to catch it, and he kept running across the road, and cars, you know, he almost got hit by a car a couple of times, and so we ended up stopping the cars, and, and here's the miracle. The person who actually was from the SPCA that actually knew the dog was driving by and saw what was going on and stopped and literally helped us finally get the dog in her car by inviting the dog to go for a ride in her car because she knew the dog. So the miracle was, you know, who would have known this person would have showed up, but there was the love space there to hold this presence for this dog's life. And, and you know, out of nowhere, this person that knew the dog showed up and was able to rescue it. Isn't that an amazing miracle story? Awesome, awesome, yeah. Yeah, when we hold the space, you know, uh, the, if you go back into the ancient Aramaic, again, this guy named Yeshua just did such awesome stuff. But he says, here's how the universe works, ask and you receive. And if what you're asking for is drama and trauma, then everybody you need to cooperate in your drama and trauma game will show up. And if what you're asking for is the active presence of love and support and being, then what will show up are the people who are going to show you the parts of you that you need to heal. And if you're really willing to go there, then what you're also going to attract is the one who can support you in moving through it. And so it is an awesome game, isn't it? Much fun. Yep. So I'm looking forward to uh, being in your presence and learning your tools to a greater extent, and uh, I'll be talking to you after the after the show. Yeah, so we'll do it. Blessings. Thanks for the call. All right. Is Dr. Tim with us today, by the way? He is, yes. Hold on a second. Let me turn him on. Tim, you're on. There you go, Tim. Are You've you been turned on. How are you this morning? Or afternoon. Well, I'm doing say. very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm blessed and highly favored. I have uh, one comment, and that is we keep talking about the dark night of the soul. And uh, the way I like, uh, the way of mastery explained it is to say it's truly the dark night of the ego and the healing True, yes. of the soul. And the healing of the soul. Yeah, definitely it's the awakening and the grounding in being that's uh, that's taking place. And and the source of it is that I've identified with all of the stuff in me that's less than love, and the process of healing that needs to happen is that I let go of that identification and use the yeah. tools to dismantle it. Yeah. And and interestingly enough, when we're ready to do that, as Richard was pointing out with the uh, the person from the SPSA coming along with the, to, to invite the dog into the car, is the person who can support us in doing that is going to be right there, right there, when we're ready to uh, to receive that kind of support. And I hear that it's uh, David's very special day today, so uh, happy birthday, eternal day, David. And I would offer Thank that you, one of much appreciated. One of the things that I like so much about David is one of the things I like about myself, and that is his perseverance. <laughs> Going for it. And yeah, it's kind of kind of cool that and stick uh, to it. Yeah, it's kind of cool that uh, you kind of uh, chose to step into a support group that David had started and have carried it on for so long. It's awesome. And uh, the gift that you're giving so many people there, and you know the these the, the support groups and the whole idea of the Mind Shifters Radio that we're so blessed to have it now, is that we can bring support to those people who are willing to move through things in a way that the world can't even start to comprehend uh, to reach that critical mass to create those eight through the gate those eight who who literally truly function as the active presence of love and of course uh, it broadens the uh, the field of people that we get to play with so we get people who bring questions up for me that show me my stuff and I get to go to another level and uh, I, you know I have to process me real fast sometimes when somebody asks a question that that triggers something in me that I haven't dealt with and so I am I'm blessed by those opportunities as I know that uh, everybody who does a support group is blessed uh, by the opportunities to uh, 
to learn forgiveness through our interaction with each other. And that awesome uh, African proverb that says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And and I sure appreciate going together with you, David, and Jeannie, and uh, Tim, and, and everybody that's in our audience that, that we're getting to do this game. And, and, you know, like bringing to awareness a game that's been around for thousands of years, the game of awakening. And that there's so many people from so many corners of the globe who are jumping on board and bringing that game in, you know, that that it was started thousands of years ago and uh, that now is a time where it seems we're ready to do critical mass. And it's it's just awesome to get to, uh, to understanding it, to get to play with it, and to get to move forward with it. And may I add something here, please? Please do. Yes, David, of course. It's yeah. your eternal day. Speak. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Tim, for being for being Tim. And, you know, I remember the first time that we met and the conversations that we had. And from day one, Michael, you may not know this about Tim. From day one, he was he was committed to this. He came to the very first live, really, why again workshop that I did as far as putting up a why again workshop. He was there for the support. He came to the to the to the meetings, and he came here to Heartland. Did an intensive. Came back two years later. Did another intensive. I do look forward to seeing you for the next one, and continuously to to do his work. I mean, the commitment and the level of 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 his dedication and his willingness. Uh, has just been fabulous, and it was so great to spend <clears throat> last year when you came, Tim, and the connection that we had for, based on the work that we've done together. I'm so grateful that you're in my life, and I appreciate you and love you very much. Right back Ditto. at you. It takes Ditto. one to know one. There you go. There you go. And, you know, when you, for those who are listening, if you really want to move forward in this work, one of the – one of the, the the best ways you can do it is to select to share it with somebody else. And, you know, you may not share it perfectly. You may not be, you know, know all of the information. Um, but when you start to share it with others, when you start to put it out there, just, you know, even small conversations about inviting people to look at life differently, what happens is you get the gift. I, I look back in my life. And, you know, there was a crossroads that happened for me about, it's now about 34, 35 years ago. I, I, the first six years of my uh, my work in this arena was just part-time. It was kind of like an interest. Actually, a, a friend of mine had um, was in the real estate business, and the company that he worked for required him to do this course. And he hated it. It was a weekend thing, and he went and did this weekend, and he hated it. And he, and he started to tell me about it, and he just... It was just a couple of lines, and I knew without question I needed to go and do this. And it was a part-time interest. I was involved in the business world. I had three businesses. I had about 60 employees, and I was totally involved in the business world. And over a period of six years, I, I you know, part-time taught this and gradually started to really understand the power of it. And when I really started to understand the power of it was when I started to teach it. It was a part-time interest. And then after some time of doing that, I literally woke up one morning and was told, okay, it's time to walk away from the business world, and it's time to go back to school, and it's time to do this as a full-time occupation. Now, you want to talk about forced growth. <laughs> it will teach you everything you need to learn. But you know, And you don't have to go that extreme, but just to start to share it with others is so empowering. And I'm, I know David could attest to that. I know Tim could. You know, when I first met Jeannie, we had been uh, communicating uh, for about three months and had met a couple of times before she did her first workshop. And we did a series of five workshops in Johnson City, Tennessee. Jeannie lived in, in Bristol, Tennessee. We did a series of five workshops. And the next week, you know, I went on the road, and the next week Jeannie started a support group, started to teach the work. Ginny, how has that impacted your life? Well, it, you know, like I just told somebody in the chat room, we teach best that which we most need to learn. And 
so by teaching it, I was learning it on a, a different level and definitely moving into more conscious awareness. Yeah, and, you know, and, and interestingly, another thought comes to me as we're talking, sweetie, and that is that um, before I popped the question to Jeannie, did she want to get married, I said, now, you, you see the life I lead, you see what I'm doing. She she had uh, was in a job where she could um, take off Monday. She could do a four-day week, so one week she'd, uh, she'd take Friday off, and the next week she'd take Monday off. So we'd have a four-day weekend. We'd travel and do workshops. And so before I actually popped the question, uh, I said, Jeannie, do you think, that, I mean, is this something you're really ready to do? This is pretty intense. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, I am. I said, well, okay, let, let's take, and I think we, you took two weeks off work, and uh, we did a workshop, I think, just about every day for that two weeks. And uh, I, I want to honor somebody here as we're speaking, and that is that uh, one of those weeks we actually did a Sunday service and then a Sunday afternoon workshop, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and an all-day Saturday Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing, which was the most inten- intense exposure Jeannie had to work at that point. And we were at Unity of Birmingham, where the minister's name is uh, Jerry Bartholo. And Jerry's someone that, uh, geez, I've known for 20-plus years. And uh, we've spoken at the church over the years. He's come to Heartland. Uh, we've become very, very connected friends. And, um, and Jerry's actually in process. And I just put this out as an invitation. We got a call yesterday. Uh, Jerry's been dealing with cancer for several months. And uh, he had decided to stop doing radiation and that he was just going to let go. Uh, So we were on the phone with Jerry yesterday and uh, his wife, Jane. And we just want to honor both of you for the impact you folks have had on the world and and that you've had on our work. Actually, the, the, when I do a blessing of, of donations when we travel, a part of that blessing comes from Jerry's uh, thoughts and Jerry's work. But um, yesterday we called uh, to acknowledge and just to say hi to Jane. And uh, and the day before, Jerry was not communicating, but yesterday he communicated and uh, he got on the phone. And I said, gee, Jerry, you know, it, it sounds like you're getting ready to check out. Is that is that what's happening? He says, well, you know, I did make that decision a couple of days ago, but, you know, today I'm not so sure. I, I think I might just hang in here. And so uh, if if you would, if everybody in our audience would just think about Jerry and Jane Bartholow and surround them in light, surround them in love. And if Jerry decides that it's time to go, uh, let's just send him all the light we can to clear his field of anything that he would take with him that's unlike love so that he goes direct to the light as he leaves his body, if that's what he chooses to do. And or if what he chooses to do is to re-empower his form and carry on his awesome work here on the planet, that we send that light and that support for him. In either case, that it's a joyful light that we send to you, Jerry and Jane. And we hold the space uh, for your healing and for your process in your eternal essence. And we're delighted to be sharing the planet with you and delighted for all the years of connectedness and play and work and and awesome things we've gotten to do together. And we cherish you and, and honor having shared the planet with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that was Jeannie's first really intense um, experience was that full week at Unity of Birmingham. And we went from there to Memphis, Tennessee, and, and we went to the, uh, the, um, uh, what you, the Peabody Hotel. And it's like, so Jeannie, are you really ready to do this? Yes. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Peabody, but uh, it's actually a, an old hotel, a really classic hotel in uh, in Memphis. And back in the 30s, as I recall it, the uh, the guy who owned the hotel and he and a bunch of buddies would go out and have drinking weekends and, and go duck hunting. And uh, some of the guys that he, uh, he worked with um, – or went hunting with, they went out and got drunk, and he got home drunk, and and they had captured some ducks, and they decided that they'd play a joke, and they brought ducks in and put them in the, there, there was there's a pond in the middle of the uh, a fountain, pardon me, in the middle of the uh, the hotel lobby, so they brought these ducks in, and the next morning he woke up from his drunk, and there were these ducks in his pond, and people are gathered around, and it's now a tradition. They actually have a a, a, a doorman who's all dressed up to the nines with his uh, his tail and and top hat, who every morning uh, goes up to the roof of the hotel where the ducks are uh, housed and brings them down, rolls out a red carpet and into the the, uh, uh, pond they go or the the fountain 
And so uh, I, when Jeannie said yes, she was ready, I got down on my knees in front of the ducks and proposed. So that's how we uh, came to meet each other. And we work on this process of forgiveness. We're here to share it with you, and we invite you to have the best year yet of your eternal life. Bring a stranger with you tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. And number six, Erica 619, please call in tomorrow. We ran out of time before we got your call. Thank you all for joining us.